You may be seated. Thanks, team. And turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians. We're coming to the end of this little letter. We've been in it for some time, and I hope we've seen some glorious things. hope you've seen Jesus, the all-sufficient Christ. Colossians chapter 4. The text this morning is verses 2 to 6. Colossians 4, 2 to 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. These are God's words. Let's pray. Lord, take your words and burn them deep in our heart, so much so that we have a changed heart that desires what you desire, that loves what you love, that has a passion for what you are passionate about. Teach us and mold us. For your sake we pray. Amen. The message in this, this morning is entitled, Gospel Missions Matter. Gospel Missions Matter. One preacher from another century, actually, uh, commented on what he calls the cheap jacks of his time, which would be kind of like um, our flea market salesperson, you know, the, the, the person that gets a whole bunch of stuff from hither and yon and then sets it up in a booth, and, you know, they have all kinds of who knows what. Th- this preacher was, was uh, thinking about these cheap jacks as they stand there with their wares and they watch the crowd go by. They, they pick out something about each person that they see and they call it out. Right? They, they try to figure out, just based off of appearance, what that person might need. And then they make sure that they hold that item up and they, they maybe even make some sort of a joke or about that person or this characteristic or something like that. Whatever it takes to get that person's attention to turn and look at their item so that then they can hopefully turn them into uh, a buyer. The, the, the preacher said this about these skipjacks and about us said, would to God that preachers and other workers for God had a tenth as as much common sense and were half as earnest to bring men to Jesus Christ as the cheapjack is to bring them to buy. He said, oh, that we were so wise to win the ear and heart of the particular case with which we have to deal as he is is, uh, in extorting a laugh and compelling the attention of the passerby. Oh, that we would have the same sort of zeal for the gospel of Christ to gain attention from somebody that's in front of us, to turn and look upon Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning, how, how does a heart like that develop in, in individuals and as a congregation where this type of gospel mission matters? How, how do we go toward that heart? where when we see a person in front of us, our first thought is, I wonder if they know Christ. I wonder how I can put Christ in front of them so that they look to him as glorious. That's, that's our text, that's our topic this morning, is gospel missions matter. We're going to see four points that help us to develop a heart where missions, gospel missions matter to us. The first point is prayerful urgency. Prayerful urgency from verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So prayerful urgency is both adamant and alert. Prayerful urgency is both adamant and alert. We must be adamant in our prayers. The the command in verse 2 is to continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, the word here for this phrase really is one word. Be steadfast. 
It's one command, but it's in the, the present tense, which means that it's an ongoing command. So continually be steadfast. Keep at this. Be adamant about this. So the place then of prayer in the life of the believer ought to be adamant. It ought to be unyielding. As the scripture says, it ought to be unceasing. Prayer is that important. It is that urgent for us that this be a part of our lives. But how often when we read that verse or we see it in Hobby Lobby, we think, pray without ceasing. How can I do that? How is that even possible? Right? And we dwell on the, the seeming impossibility of, of unceasing, unrelenting prayer. But maybe instead, let's look on the flip side and ask the question, why do we give up in prayer? What, what causes us to cease in prayer? Is it not because we become impatient at times? Don't we cease in prayer because we become uninterested? Isn't it the case that sometimes we cease in prayer because we just frankly get discouraged? We haven't gotten an answer. How, how, do, we, how do we battle this? How do we then as believers become adamant continuing steadfastly in our prayers when we have all of these things that want to distract us away from prayer? Well, the answer is, of course, Christ. The sufficiency, the, 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 the fact that Christ is enough, the, the fact that Christ answers all of our prayers, He hears all of our prayers, the fact that He is Lord over all the universe and causes all things to happen for our good and for His glory, that fact alone is enough to cause us to continue in prayer. When you think about who Jesus is, He's the King of the universe. And He tells us to pray. He invites us to pray. He commands us to continue in prayer. I want to turn back to Luke chapter 18. Jesus told a parable here. You can listen to it if you want to, to not turn there. Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So let's listen to this parable. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, and here's the point, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Huh. Nevertheless, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? faith on the earth. What is Jesus saying in this parable? He says, if even a crooked judge will give in because he's been beat on and been unrelentingly asked again and again and again for something, how much more will a righteous father give to his children who cry to him? Right? We have to first re recognize who it is that we're praying to. That's one of the key ways that we continue in prayer is that we see God who is our good Father, who calls us to come to Him and ask things of Him. But then He says, that, that he, or He asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, is He going to find that kind of faith? Is He going to find unrelenting faith? Is He going to find adamant prayers? Our command is for urgency. Is for urgency. Because Christ is coming. This is, this is what I mean when I say urgency in prayer is both adamant and alert. Back to our text in Colossians. He says, continue, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. That word being watchful is the word for being awake, being alert. And this is the manner in which we are to continually going about our prayers. We're, 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 we're praying, but we're not playing, praying half asleep. We're praying watchfully, with alertness, 
watching for an answer, praying with faith, knowing to whom we are praying, and the fact that he answers prayer. We are watchful and alert. This is the same word that's uh, used to describe that, that group of monks, the Gregorian monks, that, that wake at all hours of the night to go and pray and to chant and to sing. Right, three o'clock in the morning, dung, dung, dung. They get up, they go, they do their prayers, they chant, they come back to bed. Three hours later, dung, dung, dung. They get up, they walk, they watch, they wait, they pray. This is the type of prayers we ought to have. Watchful prayers, but watchful for what? Luke 18, that we just read that parable, indicates that we watch for an answer to prayer, trusting that it'll come. Right? Pray with faith. But when we search the pages of our, of our Bibles for this word, be watchful, what we find is over half of the occurrences of this word are tied specifically to Jesus' return, to Jesus' coming. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. It's just one book to the right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want you to see how this watchfulness applies to our prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5.1 Jesus says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware, you're awake, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He says, we don't need to tell you about Jesus' coming. You know. You're aware of this. You're awake to that reality. Now turn over to Revelation, to the right, a few more books. Last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 3. Jesus himself writes this little letter to a church in the town called Sardis. And he says in verses 1 through 3, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, alive, but you are dead. Wake up! That's the same word. And strengthen what remains. And is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So do you see that watchfulness has an eye toward Jesus' second coming? So when we then pray with watchfulness, we are praying knowing that Jesus will return. But our prayers, this watchfulness, is not like the type of watchfulness where folks go out into the middle of a field and keep their eye to the sky and huddle around together and wait for Jesus to come. No, it's, it's not watchfulness for Jesus' return as much as it is watchfulness in light of Jesus' return. So we are alert to the fact that he could come at any moment. And rather than that meaning that we then just pray, Lord, just come back so that I don't have to go to those heathens over there. <laughs> right? Lord, just come back and judge them so that we don't have to do missions anymore. Right? Lord, I just pray that, that you would just come quickly because this whole gospel missions thing is messy and people lose their lives and, and people give up their retirement and all this kind of stuff to go overseas and do really foolish things. Lord, if you would just return then we wouldn't have to deal with any of this. No, of course that's not what he means by pray with watchfulness. He means that we pray in the way that we know that Jesus is returning and we want to be found faithful when he does return. We need to be alert and awake in our prayers, praying with faith, with the reality that Jesus is coming with urgency in our prayers because we don't know the day or the hour when he will return and we order our lives we order our prayers around that fact so let me ask you this morning is there urgency in your prayers do you have this type of urgency does jesus's return animate your prayers to make you adamant in your pleading? to make you alert, watching for an answer. You want to be found faithful, so you pray with faith that he hears and that he will answer. Do you feel a burden for those who don't name the name of Christ as Lord? 
who are lost, who don't know Jesus and will perish? Do you believe that they'll perish if they don't hear the name of Jesus and turn to him in faith? Are you convinced, absolutely convinced of God's heart for the lost? If not, you need to hear these words from 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. How many people? All. And then he tells us what kinds of people we should pray for. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, listen, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Friends, why is there urgency in our prayers for those who don't name Christ as Savior? Because without naming Christ as Savior, they will perish. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But praise God, the scriptures say that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But he goes on in Romans 10, how then will they call on him in whom they've never believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear of him unless someone preaches? And how are they to preach unless someone is sent? As it is written, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. So then should we not see that our prayers have to be urgent in light of Christ's return to judge the living and the dead? So the word here calls us to this type of prayer, alert, unyielding, because Jesus is coming. But notice in, back in Colossians 2, the last phrase says, with thanksgiving. Now, if you've been paying attention throughout the book of Colossians, this idea of thankfulness shows up again and again and again, and it's kind of stuck in little strange places, thing, places that you don't, you don't necessarily expect. Why is it? that in our continual watchful prayers, being mindful that Christ is returning, that we would do it with thanksgiving. Well, it's because we know what Christ is for the world. We, we pray with urgency because we know that there is a solution. We know that there is a Savior. We know that Christ's return does not have to be bad news for the world, but instead it can be a glorious coming. So we pray with thankfulness because we know that there is a Savior that if they name Him as Lord, they will be saved. So then our, our urgent prayers, don't, don't become, they don't feel like a burden on our shoulders. It doesn't feel like a drag to, to go down our list of family members who don't know Christ and plead urgently for the, the Lord to save them. That's, that's not necessarily as much of a burden as it is a, a thankful reality that Jesus can save them. And so then we continue to pray. And we continue to pray with thankfulness that, that He is the Lord. So the command is for continual prayer. And that prayer to be filled with joyful, thankful urgency. But what should the content of that prayer be? We find it in verse 3. We see that we need to pray for sovereign opportunity. Sovereign opportunity. Don't worry about spelling it right. Just get, get the thought down. Sovereign. I mess it up all the time. Sovereign opportunity. It says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. See, Paul comes along and he asks these believers... While you're going about your joyful, uh, obeying that, that, that command to pray joyfully, he says, I, I'm asking you to add us to your prayer list. Pray for us. Now remember, where is Paul at this point? He, he's in prison, in Rome, likely under house arrest, with, with fellow laborers like Epaphras coming and going, 
to him throughout the ancient world carrying the message of the gospel, sometimes in scrolls from Paul, other times mostly with their mouth, preaching the gospel to all corners of the Roman world. And Paul says, pray for us. Pray for us who are about this work. Pray for me who is in chains. Pray what? Pray that God would open a door for me. And we know that Paul was faithful to this. He, he preached to all of the guard, right? Talk about a captive audience, right? You just, he's sitting there in chains, and while the guard is literally chained to him, this is how they would do it, right? You, you wouldn't get locked behind doors on house arrest necessarily. You would just have a Roman guard with a big shiny spear and, and sword and shackled from your foot to his foot. You're not going anywhere, right? Well, Paul says, okay, this is an opportunity. <laughs> so then he would pray and he would preach and he'd tell them about the Lord, right? I mean, talk about being creative in missions. I mean, that, that's about as creative as you can get, right? But, but notice, what does Paul say? What, what does he ask them to pray for? He says, pray also for us that, that word that tells us, this is the content of his prayer, that God may open to us a door for the word. That God may open to us a door for the word. Notice first, it is God who opens doors for ministry. Did you hear that? It is God who opens doors for ministry. Not prime ministers, not sultans, not, not chieftains of tribes, not countries, not states. Not, not religious leaders in some other country. None of that. No, that, it is God who says, here's the open door for the gospel, for the word. This is why it is a sovereign opportunity. God alone has the, 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 uh, the prerogative. He alone has the power and the authority to say, now this country, you can go there and preach the gospel. He opens doors. For the word to go through. But also notice that the command here to pray, right? Paul is saying, pray for us. It's also an invitation to take part in God's grand plan of salvation for the world. Right? Sometimes when people hear that that fact that God is sovereign over all things and say, well, it's up to him where the door opens, some, some people like to take that and then say, well, I don't need to pray about it then because it's up to him. Right? Why would I pray if he's going to decide anyway? I'm not going to waste my time. I've got a lot of people to pray for. Yeah, except for the word tells us to pray <laughs> and, and to pray for these things specifically. Right? Rather than us ha- trying to figure out how this tension gets resolved, Why not just obey what God says and realize that he has invited you and I into his grand plan of salvation for the world? I mean, let that knock your socks off for a minute, right? The God, the sovereign Lord of the universe has invited you in your prayer closet to pray prayers for gospel opportunity where people will come to know Christ and have their eternity changed because of it and God asks you to pray for that what a joy what a joyful reality I mean what a what a personal uh, uh, motivation to become adamant and urgent in our prayers Lord you've asked me to do I don't understand I don't get it why you would ask me I don't even pray that good but you're asking me to pray for this this door to be open so I'm going to do it Lord and, and then I'm going to sit back and watch you work and and then just marvel at the reality that you have called me into this type of a ministry. I mean, praise his name. Every single one of us has a role in gospel missions. We all have a a, a necessary, urgent reality that we must obey and take part in. And praise his name, he, he, he invites us into it. But notice also that as doors of ministry are opened, Doors of jail cells close, (laughs) right? Where is Paul? Verse 3, he says, it's on account of this ministry for which I am in prison. Which I am in prison. Praise God, though, as Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy, he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, is preached in my gospel. 
for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Paul says, you can shackle me up all you want. You can put me and every other gospel minister in chains, and the word of God is not bound. You can't chain up the gospel. You can put it behind bars, and yet they're going to sink behind bars. You, you can chain them to a Roman soldier, and they're going to preach to that Roman soldier. <laughs> they're, they're, you, you can put the, the whole lot of them into, into suffering and into pain. You can make their lives awful, and that's only going to uh, magnify their gospel witness in the world. The word of God is not bound. And this is why Paul says that, that you should pray that God may open to us a door for the word. Notice, he doesn't say a dope, uh, open a door for us, but a door for the Word. So what does this tell us is the unyielding, unfettered substance of his mission? It's the Word. The Word is gospel missions. He wants to have an opportunity to declare the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. Now, we've encountered that phrase before. Flip back to chapter 1 in Colossians, verse 24. Colossians 1, 24 says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, According to the stewardship from God, notice who, who has sovereign opportunity, the Lord gives sovereign opportunity. According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is the mystery, Paul? He says, the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Right? Look down at chapter 2, verse 2. He says that, that he wants their hearts to be encouraged, having full understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Now Paul says here, he wants an opportunity to tell people about the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery? It's the gospel. <laughs> the, the, the gospel that Christ, the, the, the Lord and Savior of the universe, can live in you. Can be the hope of glory in you. Paul says there is a dying world out there. There is a world headed toward perishing. But they don't have to. Pray that I have a chance to tell them about the hope that they can have in the truth. But, of course, the message of the gospel is not divorced from the messenger of the gospel. That's why Romans 10 says, how can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they preach unless if somebody is sent? So the, the vital connection here that brings the message alive in God's plan is the messenger. Right? The word becomes incarnate through Jesus, John 1. And then the, the word becomes incarnate as a preacher, as somebody stands and speaks the word to another image bearer and says, look to Jesus. This is why Paul then says in verse 4, he asks them to pray for revealing clarity. Revealing clarity. He says, pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. That word clear is the word for revealing. A clear gospel message reveals Christ. A clear gospel message reveals Christ. That's what he said back in chapter 1, verse 26, that this is, this is made clear. We see it in chapter 3, uh, verse 4, when he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, same word. So what happens when the gospel is faithfully preached? Jesus appears in front of them. They see Jesus. They don't see the preacher anymore. When, when, when God takes a heart of stone 
and replaces it with a heart of flesh, and he puts his spirit within them. And the, 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 as 2 Corinthians says, the veil is lifted from their eyes. What happens is they're, they're listening to the word being preached, but they're seeing Jesus. <laughs> they're seeing him as glorious and as beautiful and as their only hope in life and death. And they're seeing him as the, the perfect sacrifice for them. And they're seeing him as the sufficient savior for all of their sins. It's like the, the room goes dark around that person and they're no longer listening to the preacher, but they're just seeing their savior. This is what a clear message of the gospel does. It reveals Christ. It shows Jesus. And then people look to him and not just believe the message, but they believe Jesus. This is why believing the gospel, like we talked about last Sunday, is not believing in a message alone, but it's knowing Christ revealed in the message. So I'm going to mimic Paul here. And I'm going to say, pray for me. Pray for me, adamantly, with alertness, with urgency, that, that I may speak the message of Christ clearly, that Christ would be revealed in this gathering, that those who don't know Jesus would see him, not see me, not hear a message, not, not hear a sermon, but that they would see Jesus. You can pray for me Saturday night, Sunday morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you get the, you get the point. Pray for me. This is, this is our part in gospel missions. But it's only one part. What, what, is, what does Paul mean when he says, by the, when, he, when he uses the word ought? Did you, did you catch that little word in verse 4? He says that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. It's a word of necessity. It's a word of requirement. This is an essential nature. Paul says, if I do nothing else, I must declare the clear message of the gospel. So we see that the necessity of the mission is tied to the urgency and necessity of Christ in the world. So I wonder this morning, before we move on to the next section here, is the message of Christ that high of a priority for you? I ought to pray for this. I need, I need to pray. I got to hear this Wednesday about a ministry that, that this church has supported a long time through the thrift store called She Found His Grace. It's an abortion recovery ministry. And what I heard um, in about three hours of a presentation to pastors is stories of men and women who passionately go to some of the hardest places where the people, people who are suffering the most, and what they do is they place Jesus in front of them. And so I heard stories of men and women who have been plagued by this awful evil in their life, who have sinned an awful sin in their life, and have been carrying around guilt and anger and shame because of that. I've heard how the gospel of Jesus Christ has come in and set them free from that and given them new life and a new path forward. And I heard one man who just a year and a half ago, he, he, he took part in this, in this sin, and carried it for 18 years. And then he heard the gospel. He came to Christ. He heard that there's freedom in Christ from all our sins. And now he's preaching the gospel to men who are in the same scenario as he was a year and a half ago, and preaching it with clarity. I, I, I mean, I was blown away. I thought, man, you, you got to go to seminary before you can preach. Him. No, this guy is, is a year and a half. He still had the ankle bracelet on. Year and a half out of this. And here he is proclaiming the name of Christ and the hope of glory for folks who have this, this awful shame and guilt on them. Friends, this is gospel missions. It takes part in so many ways. I wonder, is it a priority for us? Does it rise to that level of urgency? One way we can tell is because each of us has been called 
to this type of gospel ministry. We see the last point this morning is winsome ministry. And each and every one of us is called to it. Verses 5 and 6. He tells them, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. See, the urgency and the opportunity and the clarity of Paul's gospel ministry, he says in verses 5 and 6, should be matched by individual believers in their lives. In other words, what we pray for in verses 2 through 4 is what we ought to become in verses 5 through 6. The command is given in verse 5 to walk in wisdom. In other words, live wisely. Wisdom is this, knowing reality and acting accordingly. Did you catch that? Wisdom is knowing reality and acting accordingly. So a fool will know the truth but not act according to it. A wise person knows the truth and then orders his or her life according to that truth. Do you see? So, so what is the truth here? He says a couple of things in verse 5. First of all, there are outsiders. He uses the word outsiders. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. These are people who do not know Christ, who have not been raised to new life with Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13 uses the exact same word to, to compare those who are in the church and those who are outside of the church. Right? So the first reality that we need to know is that in a sin-fallen world, there are people who are outside of the church and are in need of the Savior. Right? So the message of universal salvation, the message of a pluralistic faith that, that all people are, are really people of God that are just searching Him up different sides of the mountain, totally false. There are those who are inside and those who are outside. Those who are inside are here because of God's grace because of his working in our hearts, and opening our eyes to the gospel, those who are outside need to hear that message. Okay, so the, the first reality is that there are people who are outside. But we also must know the truth that time is short. And so then missions toward outsiders is urgent. This is why he says, making the best use of the time. Walk in wisdom toward these people, making the best use of the time. The word here is redeeming the time. Ephesians says, because the days are evil. Right? So what, what the, the picture is, is it's an economic one. It says that this time right now, time is under the, the bondage of evil. Okay? Evil owns time. And he says what we need to do is we need to go buy time out from underneath evil. Okay? Pay the price to get that time out from underneath the, the devices of the evil one and instead use it for good. Why? Because those folks are outside and Jesus is coming again and therefore it is urgent. Are you following? So then these facts put together make the action of verse 6 obvious. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The speech here in, in, in verse 6 is grace-filled speech. It gets translated as gracious. We have a different understanding of gracious here. I'll show you why it's grace-filled back in chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 3. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it's bearing fruit and increasing, as it does also among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. What was the message that they heard? It was the message of the grace of God. And so now at the end of Paul's letter, he's saying what you need to do, believers, is take the message of grace to those who are outside of the church. I'm praising the Lord at the beginning of the letter that you who are inside the church heard the message of grace and now I'm telling you at the outside of the letter, at the end of the letter, to go take that message of grace to those who are outside. Are you following? Let your, let your speech be gracious or grace-filled, seasoned with salt. Now, salt is used in different ways in the scriptures. I think the way that he's using it here is to talk about wise 
and winsome speech, right? Wise and winsome speech, right? If you know that your food is a little bit bland, right? Maybe you're just going to add a little salt because you want your guests to enjoy it, right? You're wise. You know that you didn't put too much flavoring in there, so you're just going to go ahead and remedy that, okay? Right? Wise speech, winsome speech, right? Seasoned with salt. Now, the question is, what, what does this mean? Does this mean that it's always nice? Apparently not, because Paul's in prison. Apparently, a gracious message does not always make everybody happy. Right? Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, we're told that he was a man full of grace and the Spirit. And what did he do? He preached. And he told those Jews that he was preaching to that you are stiff-necked Jews who always resist the Holy Spirit. This man was full of grace. <laughs> and they stoned him. Then Paul, a few chapters later in Acts chapter 17, says that he was provoked in his spirit by all the idols that were around him. And so what does he do? He goes into the, to the, to the uh, Areopagus, to the marketplace, and he reasons with them about Jesus and the resurrection. And some mocked him, but some asked him to hear some more. And some even believed. They didn't run him out of town. So apparently, the reaction to the message is not what determines whether the message is grace-filled or not. Are you following? Some people will respond to a gracious, grace-filled message with hatred because they don't want to say that they need grace. They don't want to admit that they need it, and so they're angry. They're spitting mad. They're hostile. No matter how grace-filled your message is. Right? When we talk about winsome, we don't mean that you just make everybody like you. No, that's not a faithful message. We need to make the message clear. But we do it in a way so that people don't get turned away automatically because of our speech. You see? So how do we know the difference between the person that's standing in front of us? The answer is wisdom. Is this person hurting because of maybe an abortion in their past? Maybe they need to hear that there's forgiveness at the cross. Maybe they need to hear about the way that Jesus treated sinners. Called them to stop called them to, to repentance, and called them to forgiveness and freedom? Do you have somebody who is, is building up arguments against Christ and against the knowledge of Christ? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, destroy them. Destroy the arguments. Tear down the strongholds. He says, take every thought captive for Christ. We've got to know the difference. We've got to know who's in front of us. But the point is this morning is that every believer has a gospel mission. And the gospel mission requires that we speak. We speak to God in prayer about it. And then we speak to those who are outside with wisdom. This is not just the preacher's job. This is not just the evangelist's or the apologist's or the sidewalk counselor's job. It is every believer's duty, joyful duty to walk in wisdom and to speak graciously to those who are outside. It may seem intimidating. It is. But, but it does take some preparation. Right? It, the, 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 but the, basis drive, the basic driving factor behind this is knowledge, care about the lost, and knowledge of hope. So do you have knowledge of, the, of hope? Do you know Jesus? Do you care about those who don't know Jesus? Put those two things together and the logical conclusion is go tell them about Jesus. It's as simple as that. But if this is something that you're, you're, you're struggling with, I want to I encourage you. I wanna, well, I want to do more than encourage. I want to exhort you, okay? So encouragement with oomph, okay? I want to exhort you to come to this, uh, this pre-conference on April 28th over in Osceola. There's two different ministries that are going to come and they're going to help us they're going to give us practical advice on how to do this, how to know what type of person is in front of you, what to say to them. And then they're going to take us out and we're going to watch them do it. We're going to listen to the way they interact with people who are outside of the church. And then we're going to be called to, to practice that ourselves, to have conversations ourselves. Right? Do the uncomfortable thing in order to be obedient to the word of Christ. There's a dying world that needs it. And we're each called 
to this. So the the central necessity of this passage is that gospel missions, gospel missions of the word matters. And I wonder, does it matter to you? Let's pray. What a great hope we have, Lord. What a firm foundation we have. Lord, it seems like the the earth is shaking beneath us. The world around us is crumbling. Headline after headline, they get closer and closer to home. Things are just messed up. And Lord, you've given us the hope of the world. A gospel which cannot be shaken. Help us, Father. Cause us to be faithful. Give us boldness and courage where this type of missions that is on your heart matters and is on our heart. We pray it for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks, Austin.